Part of that has been all this talk we keep hearing about reparations uh, for slavery. We know about the madness in California, but now we've got King Charles, who is signalling his support for further research into the British monarchy's <laughs> historical links with the trans transatlantic uh, slave trade. <laughs> And the king has not ruled out, Douglas, the possibility of paying reparations. Uh, do you think the king of England will also consider reparations for, I don't know, the families of the Brits who were sold into slavery? Does he even know that that happened? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's extraordinary. I, I, I can save him um, uh, the time and um, a certain amount of money uh, by by telling him uh, what, what the what the historical situation is. I'm sure he's aware of it. I'd, I'd like to think that this is a sort of uh, outmaneuvering by the king and that he's well aware that actually the history of the British monarchy <laughs> Uh, is a very noble history by the end about the slave trade. The, the, uh, King, King uh, George III signed the Anti-Slavery Act in the first decade of the 1800s. Um, uh, you know, consecutive British monarchs uh, after the British abolished slavery, not just in Britain, but across the empire, and then policed the abolition of the trade across the high seas. Uh, consecutive British monarchs spoke out incredibly forcefully, as well as enacting actual laws against slavery. So it's it's a rather strange thing for King Charles to, to do. I'm hoping, as I say, that it's a sort of um, uh, uh, some kind of bluff of a kind uh, uh, so that the people who say, aha, we're going to finally get the secret history, because, of course, after all, Rita, uh, uh, the history of the British monarchy is incredibly secretive. I mean, uh, nobody has ever commented upon it and there are no books on it. And there's no way there's no way you could find out any of this stuff from simply oh, going to a library or something. Um, I'm hoping that this is all all to sort of pacify the, the know-nothings and then educate them, to use one of their favourite terms, in the fact that actually the British monarchy and the slave trade is, a, is something to be proud of. Uh, the British monarchy led the way in the abolition of slavery, uh, long ahead uh, of much of the rest of the world. Africa continued slaving for decades, still does in parts today. China has effectively a slave uh, market these days in workers. Uh, so I, I don't know uh, uh, what the king is thinking, but I hope that it's 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 a great bluff to, to to call out all those ignoramuses who think they know everything and think that if they turn over any rock in the West, they just find evil. And in fact, in actual fact, on this occasion, as on so many others, you'll find some bad things, but you'll also find an awful lot of good and, and how shocking and upsetting that will be for a certain type of person. Well, it won't be, Douglas, because they'll just ignore that and focus on the couple of bits of uh, uh, bad things that they didn't know before that they'll find yes. out through this investigation. Now, I mentioned the fact that there were Brits, white British people, uh, Europeans, mm. who were also victims of the slave trade. You've spoken yes. about this. I know you've written about the, uh, the Arab slave trade as well, but this is the sort of stuff that isn't known widely and mm. isn't talked about. I mean, you, for all we know, could be entitled to reparations. Perhaps one of your ancestors were one of these unfortunate Brits who fell into uh, yes. the slave market. Yes, the Bar Barbary pirates and, and the North African slavers uh, had ships. Uh, we used to go out and snatch people from coastal towns on the south coast of England, around the coasts of Britain, actually, uh, uh, and across uh, southern Mediterranean Europe. Uh, around a million or so uh, people uh, were thought to have been abducted in that way and sold into slavery in Africa. And that's ignoring, of course, the millions upon millions, the tens of millions of, of Africans who were sold into slavery by their fellow Africans. Uh, so if, if people are going to talk about reparations, as I've said for a long time, uh, it, it better be a fulsome reckoning. Uh, and people might be surprised about who has to pay money to who. Well, yes, that will be fascinating. Now, we know the world's richest man, Elon Musk, owns Twitter nowadays, but this week he also well and truly owned the BBC after this <laughs> train wreck of an interview with the BBC's James Clayton. Can, right. you, can you name one example? I, I honestly don't use... I, I, honestly, you I don't... You can't name I, a single example. I'll tell you why, because I don't actually use that for you feed anymore, because I, I just don't particularly like it. But you actually, said a lot, of people, a lot of people are quite similar. I, 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 only, well, I only look well, at my, my following. Hang on a second. You said you've seen more hateful content, but you can't name a single example, not even one. I'm not sure I've used that feed for the last three or four weeks. And I, well, I, then I how did you see the hateful content? content? 
Because I've been I've been using I've been using Twitter since you've taken it over for the last six months. Okay, so then you must have at some point seen that you for you hateful content. I'm asking for one example. Right. And you I, can't give a single I, I, one. And, and, and I'm saying. I, I, then I, I say, sir, that you don't know what you're talking about. Really? Yes. <laughs> Douglas, do you think the BBC <laughs> learned anything from that humiliation, or are they just going to double down on their hate speech disinformation? It was an extraordinary interview, wasn't it, Rita? I mean, an absolutely extraordinary interview. The BBC has some fine journalists in it still. It certainly has historically had some of the best interviewers in the world. Uh, I don't think that a Jeremy Paxman or an Andrew Neil would have gone in and ever have gone into an interview like this so completely unprepared as this man, uh, Clayton, did. Uh, he, he seemed to have no facts at his fingertips. And if you're going to if you're going to interview the world's richest man, one of the most interesting people on the planet, who's doing some of the most fascinating and groundbreaking work of anyone on planet Earth, you ought to go in with more than oh, I've heard about Haiti, Haiti, Haiti words. I, I mean, there's something sort of totally <laughs> pathetic, a nursery kindergarten about this, isn't there? This sort of, oh, I have a narrative about Haiti, Haiti words, and I'm going to stick to it. And, oh, I don't have any examples, but then, uh, then who, who cares? This journalist in question actually did a thread on Twitter about all the stories that had been reported by all oh, the New York Times and the usual list of, of media on the back of the interview, and he completely buried the lead. The lead was that he himself knew nothing and was exposed by Elon on Musk during the interview for knowing nothing. You know, this guy didn't even ask Elon Musk about the Twitter files, about what had been unearthed since Elon Musk mm. bought Twitter, or why Twitter was so successful after Elon Musk fired so many of the staff, in fact, more successful. This is just an example of the way in which sections of the mainstream media adopt a narrative, stick with it, even in the face of the facts. And they, they turn out to have no facts themselves. And then they sort of resent it when somebody else has facts and calls them out on it. I thought it was an utterly pathetic interview. I was embarrassed for him as a journalist. And I was embarrassed as a British person to see somebody of this sort of kindergarten level trying to play in the big boys field. It was just embarrassing. It was embarrassing. And the arrogance to go into that interview so yes. unprepared. You are dealing with a man, whatever you think of him, who's the world's richest man, he's wildly successful, and it seemed to have no respect for that. I think he thought, I'm the smartest man in the room and I'm going to show up Elon Musk, and that is not what happened. Uh, Douglas Murray, no, you're isn't. always the smartest man in the room. Thank you so much for joining <laughs> me today. It's a great pleasure as always.